Tov, Chavarim, and welcome once again to a soulful psalm. Uh, today we are going to move on to a psalm that probably is very familiar to you. This might be almost as familiar as Psalm 23. This is uh, Psalm 121, or as Shlomo Karlbach in the opening sequence uh, shared with us, uh, um, Esa Enai. From where does my help come? Uh, this is used by our congregation constantly. We almost always use the Karlbach musical version of it, which has dominated uh, Jewish liturgy now since the 1960s. Uh, it is um, so familiar that um, people have many opinions about it. And I will uh, I will talk to you now. Uh, Karl Bach only uses the first verse or first two verses of the uh, psalm. There's much more to it. Uh, we normally recite it uh, in length on the high holy days, and not necessarily when we use it during Shabbat. We only use the Karl Bach song uh, during uh, regular services. Now, in a Jewish tradition, this is very much how it has been treated. It, sometimes it's read in entirety, but most of the time it is used as part of a lectionary where a verse or two is extracted and incorporated into things. Most famously in, or, in Orthodox tradition, it's used for the bedtime Shema, but uh, there are a number of different aspects to it. Uh, uh, the simplest translation, and there's always some things that can be said about uh, Hebrew is uh, it starts out as a dialogue and uh, it asks a rhetorical question. Uh, I turn my eyes to the mountains from whence will my help come? My help comes from the Lord or Adonai, maker of heaven and earth. That's really all we sing uh, when we do that. Now, a uh, slight uh, technical subtlety from Hebrew to English. Uh, the um, the phrase Ezri Meim Adonai uh, actually uh, doesn't have uh, a direct verb in it. So uh, one can understand that means Adonai does help or alternatively Adonai can help, doesn't promise us that we're going to get help, but it's possible. And so that is the significant feature of that. It goes on. It's a short psalm. It goes on and says, uh, he will not let your foot give way. Your guardian will not slumber. See the guardian of Israel, neither slumbers nor sleeps. Now that is a, a progressive parallelism where uh, we get increasing affirmation when we go from the first stick to the second stick. Um, and that is used in different places within Jewish liturgy. The Lord is your guardian. The Lord is your protection at your right hand. Again, increase specificity in the parallelism. And then you get a chiasmus built in here. By day, the sun will not strike you, nor the moon by night. And that is both a chiasmus. It crosses over. Uh, the major elements of the uh, uh, speech elements of the of the poem, but it's also a mirrorism, day and night, sun and moon. Uh, the idea is every the at uh, those two extremes and everything in between, however you imagine. Uh, the Lord will guard you from all harm. The Lord will guard your life. The Lord will guard you uh, going and coming now and forever. And this is also um, a uh, mirrorism, uh, going and coming. And uh, it's uh, one that I have used multiple times. Adonai yishmor tzeitecha uvech 
Meatav Ad Olam. And again, I tend to use it with the idea, may God, rather than God will uh, protect you in your coming and going. But in any case, uh, it's a short, pithy psalm. Its origins are probably liturgical. Uh, it seems to be designed uh, to be uh, chanted in public and maybe even have a response to it. It is a um, Shir Hamalot psalm, one of the 15 songs of ascent that are identified in this, the fifth book of the uh, book of Psalms. So it is most likely something that the Levites sang on the staircase going up to the temple. That's a song of ascents, a song of the steps, a song of the staircase. And so it, we can read this quite literally. And uh, this is probably what was done. So it was written as liturgy. Now, because it's so popular, it has gotten mixed reviews. Um, I remember vividly my psalm teacher, um, Alan Cooper, uh, saying, these are the most banal sentiments you can find in the Psalms, by which he means, uh, uh, don't worry, God is going to always be there at your side. Of course, most Psalms uh, have a lot more tension to them. I am vulnerable. I am under attack. God, why don't you help me? Why are you not there for me? Come and save me. So this one very reassuring to the point where uh, one could easily raise questions. Is that really true? And that reminds us of the fact that liturgy is not always going to give us the most complex response to things. Uh, liturgy is meant to be comforting. Liturgy is meant to be reassuring. So the idea uh, of having a psalm that says, uh, or a song that we sing during services that says, oh, maybe God will be there, maybe we'll suffer for a long time before he does, blah, 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 um, doesn't work. We want reassurance, and Psalm 21 gives it to us. So uh, can I claim that this is realistic in the everyday human experience that God will not allow your foot to stumble under any circumstances. No, I, my, I stumble all the time. I stub my toe constantly. So um, this is an aspiration rather than a fact claim. And we should recognize it as such. But we also, again, we want our liturgy to reassure us. So just to give you an example, when we uh, do the, um, uh, the poetry of Yotzer Or, we talk about the God who uh, creates light and darkness, the God who is the author of all things. Uh, that is a line from Isaiah, and it's in its original intentional form in the Bible. Uh, Isaiah makes a much more radical claim. He says, God is the author of good and evil. And so when we decided to use this passage from Isaiah for our liturgy, the rabbis felt like they had to alter it, mitigate that, uh, that absolute monotheism and the absolute claim that everything we experience comes from God by simply saying uh, the creator of all things. And we could let our imagination go, but we're in the middle of a liturgical recitation. We're not going to go leaping off into the dark. Uh, we'll, we're satisfied with the euphemism. And uh, I think that is uh, a factor in Psalm 121. And what has really sustained its popularity is what we saw at the beginning. Shlomo Karlbach's particular arrangement of the song has just taken the world by storm, and not unlike, um, say, Kol Nidre, where we primarily have uh, deep sentiments for it because of the music, so too, Psalm 121, whatever we're feeling about the semantic content, what we really are connecting to 
is the uh, elocutionary effect. That is not the content, but the way it's presented uh, that uh, uh, inspires us and we come to love it. So, and it's okay to do that. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, simply uh, reciting something very familiar has its own value. Uh, anyone who has ever felt deeply connected to even though they don't fully understand what you're saying, it's it's the music, it's the uh, the cadence that uh, touches on things within ourselves that we can't do otherwise. If we never sang these words that we don't fully understand, we wouldn't get that sense of connectedness. So um, I embrace the elocutionary effect. I embrace the uh, euphemistic or aspirational aspects of the psalm. And as a result, it uh, brings me joy and comfort every time I sing it. So with that, we're going to uh, move on to our next psalm next week. And uh, when you hear SI and I, enjoy it. Now, do realize we are in Texas. So if I lift up my eyes to the mountains, where will my help come from? It's going to, God's far away, you know, somewhere in the Rockies. But be that as it may, enjoy your week and we'll talk again.